Aloha. Welcome to Talk Story with John Waihei. Do we have a show for you today? We have, we are going to take you to the inside, the inside, the mental processes that went into one of the major stories this past week when the Department of Hawaiian Homelands announced, they announced that they wanted to see a native Hawaiian run or native Hawaiian base casino on their uh, trust lands, which as you probably know, uh, if you're a member of the public, at least generated something other than what's happening in Washington uh, as of interest to the uh, to the rest of us here in Hawaii. So, got a great show for you today. Let's get started. I want to introduce all of you to Tyler Gomes. Now, Tyler, welcome. Good to have you. Aloha. Thank you so much for having me. And tell tell us uh, tell us, uh, Tyler, what is your relationship to the Department of Hawaiian Homeland? What, what why are you? Uh, here, speaking for them today. I'm the deputy director or the deputy to the chairman for the department. So in working in concert with our chairman, William Isla Jr., together we run the department and I guess have our name stamped to this uh, interesting proposal, as you called it. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's extremely interesting and, and, and actually enlightening. Um, I, I should mention that the chairman didn't tell me, I think, along the way that he said that the uh, the brains behind that whole effort might be you. <laughs> I don't know if he was passing that off, but I nevertheless we're glad to have you. Glad to Thank have you. You know, I'll take it. It's a compliment, a very generous one at that. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us, tell us why why would the Department of Hawaiian Homelands first of all tell us why would you. Uh, even introduce such a proposal, even if it's, uh, I think, uh, well, you know, why would you do it? And second, what's the process that it, it has gone through? Sure. So I, as you know, I think you're pretty familiar with the department. This year, uh, 2021 marks the 100 year anniversary of the enactment of the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act. And when we look back on the last 100 years and everything that we have to show for that, um, I don't think it's a secret uh, that there is a lot to be desired on behalf of our beneficiaries. I think our lawmakers wish uh, to see more from the department. And so if you consider that the starting point for this discussion, we really were trying to figure out a way to make the promise of Prince Kuhio um, a reality in the next 100 years. And so what I think a lot of people know us for is developing homes. We have a number of other responsibilities. We manage loan portfolios. We have commercial property management. We run water utilities. In many ways, we're a small municipality. Um, but all of that takes money and it takes resources. And the reality is with our current uh, CIP budget, for example, being about 20 to 30 million a year and our request being about 150 million a year, we're looking at a $120 million deficit just on what we think we need and what our lawmakers believe they can afford to give us. If you look well, at- Well, that's, 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 a, that's a lot of, uh, 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 just a lot of area. Uh, uh, well, um, so the, 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 ration, the reason for the, pro, uh, for the proposal seems to be that you needed to find a source of revenue. For, to carry out the mission, the 100 year mission, but the Hawaii state constitution requires that the state of Hawaii uh, fund, I guess the word is adequate, that the state of Hawaii fund you, with, uh, provide adequate funds for you to carry on this program. And so why is it that you need to propose a casino when there is this legal mandate uh, for you to be uh, adequately funded. Yeah, that you know, the, the legal term is sufficient sums, I think, coming out of Oh, the sufficient sums, yeah. Sufficient and, is a nicer word. Yeah. <laughs> and um, that's been tied up in litigation for years. I think you've covered it previously on the show, but I think what 
what the courts have sort of found to be sufficient is still at a deficit compared to what the department deems sufficient. And until we can get folks on the same page as us, seeing what we believe to be necessary to carry out the mission, I think it's, it's upon us to continually innovate and think of new ways to generate, like you mentioned, steady, reliable sources of income that don't previously exist. Because the only way we're going to be able to plan out to serve our wait list of 28,000 Native Hawaiians waiting is additional resources. And it doesn't look like that's coming anytime soon. Well, let me ask you a question. Now, you propose that, that this uh, facility, a, a gaming facility, would be built on your trust land, at least originally, would be built on your trust lands in the Kapolei area. But uh, I think for the edification of the public, I, I, as I'm reading uh, the stories that are coming on about that, that was not the only thing that you were proposing. I mean, it, it, you were actually talking about some kind of complex, commercial complex. So besides a casino, what, what was being proposed? So what, what we wrote into the bill was to allow for a license for what's called an integrated resort in the gaming industry. And so that complex is the combination of casino and gaming facilities in addition to hotel or convention space. And so together, they all ex exist as a single <coughs> or a singularly managed integrated resort facility. So uh, the integrated resort facility out there is something, um, I, I mean, is it like a number of hotels, a casino, a uh, number of casinos? What, what's an integrated, uh, what are you talking about actually, exactly? The way we see it is a single casino with an attached single hotel with maybe additional convention space. Uh, no different than a, a single casino you would find in any other locale with um, accommodations attached to it. Uh, the license does not contemplate more than one casino. Um, so we were very, very specific about addressing the concern that, you know, many of our residents don't want to see some sprawling expansion of a strip here. We're trying to avoid that. Okay, now my understanding is that in, there was a uh, you, the proposal was pro, uh, pro, uh, proposed to the Hawaiian Homes Commission. Uh, there was a vote, mm -hmm. and it was a very close vote. It was like four to three or some. Five four. Five four. Five four, yeah, right. Nine, nine member commission, I guess. And, uh, and then, but it was also amended. So the original proposal was that this integrated resort uh, project would be built at Kapolei, but at the, after it got passed by a 5-4 vote at, by the commission, it now provides that it could be anywhere on Oahu. Is, am I correct with that? Yeah, so uh, there was concern from the commission that if we limited it specifically to Kapolei, we could potentially exclude the uh, land better suited for a casino uh, by means of acquisition. So um, the, the, the mindset behind that suggestion to amend it was really, let's not lock out the possibility that the department could acquire another parcel. Um, but the or, reality, buy, or buy a parcel. Actually. Exactly. Oh. Um, but, you know, our commercial land holdings on Oahu, it, it's not substantial. I think it's less than 95 acres. 80 of which I think are in Kapolei. So I think for people to have an understanding of how Kapolei even was the genesis for this, it's because it's the largest of our commercial land holdings. And that designation as commercial lands, that's what the beneficiaries decided upon after beneficiary consultation um, in terms of our regional and island plan. So we're really thinking about what the beneficiaries thought to see from these uh, commercially designated lands. Now, as I understand it, there's a, well, the last time I was out in Kapolei, which was a couple of weeks ago, actually, there was a lot of shopping centers and there was a lot of commercial activity. Mm -hmm. And it's actually, I've heard some developers tell me that it was actually overbuilt uh, given the size of the current population. That's some consideration given to that? I think for um, 
commercial retail, I think we've also heard the same that it's overdeveloped. Um, I, I do know that the intent is not that the integrated resort facility be um, competitive in terms of retail space. Uh, and what we've learned from experts in the field is that really surrounding the, the economics surrounding the casino, so small businesses, commercial retail, all uh, experience a windfall and a benefit from the casino being in the area. So overdeveloped or not, we're hopeful that, you know, there are echoing um, impacts, if you are rippling impacts into the extended community beyond the casino. Okay, so now the casino proposal gets passed by the commission with a five to four vote. And it, I, I assume because of what the newspaper reported, I mean, the media reported, was that uh, from there it was uh, then sent to Governor Ige as part of the administration, proposed part of the administration's legislative package to this upcoming legislative session. Uh, I, I don't know what happened then, but uh, I, uh, I immediately uh, read that the governor said, no way, <laughs> right? So yeah. not only, and, and not only did the governor say no way, I mean, it, the, in the past, the legislature itself uh, and prior governors have said uh, that uh, no gaming in Hawaii. Um, now, why why would you propose it, and where do we go from here? I think um, I think you might be a prime example as an answer to this question. If I'm not mistaken, I believe you actually vetoed a gaming bill in your time. As I, I actually vetoed the only gaming bill, the only gaming bill that passed the legislature, which was for bingo, and it was so funny because I, I, all these nice ladies uh, would would come and really get upset because they wanted to play bingo. And I would tell them, well, you know, your bishop, they were nice Catholic ladies who happened to be, you know, uh, next door to Washington Place. Well, I, I remember telling them that, um, you know, your bishop's against it. And they said, the bishop don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> he, should, he should stick to heavenly things. So anyway, so let me say, this governor may not know what he was talking about. You know, maybe you guys know something more than me. So wh think, where does it go from here? Yeah, you know, I think you're a prime example for people sort of oh. learning more about the topic and maybe changing their mind. And what we are grateful to the governor for is he's allowed the Hawaiian Homes Commission to sort of exercise its inherent authority to make this kind of decision and let that conversation keep going. So from here, if the governor chooses not to include it in his package, there's still the opportunity to take it to the legislature. Uh, we've had interest expressed on both sides uh, to introduce it. So, you know, we're not, we're not disillusioned to the fact that this is a huge uphill battle, um, but- But know, again, the principle is the uh, Department of Hawaiian Homelands needs a source, hopefully an independent source of revenue. Is that's that right? A, a reliable independent source. It's not to say that the legislature as our primary funding source isn't reliable, but if we look at the last 20, 50 years, funding levels have changed uh, throughout different generations and different eras. And, you know, it makes it very difficult to plan for housing development in these six year development windows when every year you technically have to go back and reaffirm what you're getting in terms of funding. Um, the reassurance of knowing you were going to get a steady amount every single year from the same source that, uh, you know, that would be a game changer for this department. Well, I tell you what, we're going to take a short break and we're going to come back and you can tell us why, okay. why that would matter to the department and what do you intend to do with it if you got it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. 
Welcome back to Talk Story with John Wahee and my special guest, Tyler Gomes. And we are talking about gambling and Native Hawaiians. So anyway, so there's a chance, as we were discussing, that the governor will say no. I mean, I think he will as, as a personal matter, but because of the unique position of Hawaiian home and uh, as a quasi, anyway, independent uh, department, he uh, is not, he, he is not uh, forbidding you, I guess, uh, from, you know, at least uh, taking up the issue with the legislature directly or separate. That yeah. my own. And so, I, no, no. So uh, I was going to say, so you expect that there will be hearings or s how, what, what happens? What can people expect? Um, well, assuming we can get introductions on both sides, of uh, the legislature, um, these bills will go towards the um, committee referrals. We'll see what committees we get to. Um, if we're lucky enough that it's not a whole bunch of triple referrals, uh, then I think the question of, are there going to be hearings? What opportunities are there to continue this discussion with our lawmakers, with the public, who at that point will have an opportunity to sort of opine on their thoughts? I think that's what's next for us. But, you know, no matter how it goes, I think the huge benefit to the department here is we've got people talking about there's a huge funding shortage and there's no plan right now to make it up. And maybe someone else out there with the brains has another amazing idea and this discussion hopefully sparks that person into you know bringing so there's a strategic purpose as well as just uh, as a financial one i mean one would be to uh, which which i think they're saying which is that it, it'll highlight what the lack of resources has meant uh for the uh for the department now I, you know, and again, you know, this issue has come up before the before the state legislature has come up uh, in Hawaii on many occasions. And actually, it's uh, it's it, there were polls read on whether or not we should have gaming in Hawaii. And uh, contrary to what people may believe, they have actually. Uh, the majority of people actually thought it would, might be a good idea uh, over the polls over the years, but nevertheless, it has never made it through, um, mainly because of what people felt might happen uh, with the social with the social impact of it, you know. Mm -hmm. And so there was always this discussion about whether the revenues that you got and your ability to put thousands of Hawaiians in homes are, would outweigh the fact that uh, some people might get addicted to it. Yeah. We've um, been very fortunate to do a lot of reading on the topic. Um, and what the science actually shows is that, the, first of all, there's already a, ga a gambling problem in Hawaii. It, at about 2.2% of the population. And that's the same across the country, between one and 2%. What the science shows is that the introduction of a casino actually doesn't cause that rate to go up by very much and it restabilizes, the community adapts. And so there is no data that shows a, a link uh, between introduction of gaming and a spike in problem gambling. And the same is true for crime statistics. Um, many communities actually see stable or sometimes a decrease in crime in, once they introduce a casino. And that's not because casinos result in a reduction of crime. It's because those very communities and the casinos themselves have a vested interest in putting resources towards public health and safety. And that community then reaps the benefits. Having that data now and drafting the bill allows us to know that if we dedicate resources towards problem gambling, addiction, and public health and safety ahead of time, we have a better chance of keeping those statistics relatively low like the rest of the country has experienced. Now, in other cases that I've seen that usually when the casino is being proposed, what happens is that the person that uh, we already, uh, the, the, the people who want it, like say the Department of Hawaiian Homes, usually have some idea of 
or some contact with or a partnership or something with somebody in the business. And uh, is that, uh, okay, let's say tomorrow you get your casino. Can you actually run the thing? Well, the way the bill is designed is it doesn't give us the casino. It just gives the department the exemption to host one on their land. Uh, the department can't afford to build or run it itself. So ideally, someone else will do it for us. So uh, that's your plan. The plan would be you get the, the ability to do it, and then you go and find a, a business partner like you would for any other commercial activity. Right. And we'd seek out the most qualified applicant. And I think Which, we can wrap. Oh, go ahead. Uh, there's been some talk, though. Some people in opposition to all of this have uh, has have indicated that if the uh, Department of Hawaiian Homes uh, had the uh, uh, authority to to uh, put, establish or develop a casino, that uh, this might open the door to having Native Americans who have casinos on the U.S. continent to come to Hawaii and open up a casino. Is that correct? Is that something that we ought to be worried about? No, it's not correct and it's not something we have to be worried about. As an attorney, I think you'll enjoy this sort of exercise in thinking about it. But the Indian uh, Gaming Regulatory Act, which is referred to as IGRA, um, does allow federally recognized tribes the ability to host gaming operations off their reservation. But in order to do so, they need to go through a special process with the Department of the Interior to have that land taken into trust. And the Department of the Interior has guidelines about when they can do so. And all of those guidelines are tied to that tribe's relationship to the land, whether or not that land was a part of their former reservation. Maybe they were never recognized, but historically they were in the area. And none of those things are true for any tribe with they, there is no tribe in the United States that has ties to Hawaii. In addition to that, the Department of the Interior's process that would allow tribal gaming out, off reservation requires consent by the leadership of the state in which it's happening. And unless a governor of Hawaii agreed to allow a tribe to come here, it's... After they have established that they will be doing it on Indian land. It's right. what you say, right? It's a, a leak. I don't want to call it an impossibility. It's just a highly improbable legal outcome. Um, so I don't think it's something we have to worry about. But, you know, that's something that we have to continue talking about because it's an old sort of fear. Yeah, it's an old fear. I think Danny Noe had that fear. So he made it very difficult. If not impossible. I think it's impossible for that to happen. But anyway, um, Okay, you got your casino, you're going to have this money. What are you doing with it? Why in the world should people care? I mean, I, you know, uh, what are you doing? What's some new exciting things that are happening at the department? Well, I think when people think about what the department does, they think the classic, what we call a turnkey home. So we give land with the house built on it and the beneficiary mortgages the home. What we also do is we offer vacant lot offerings, which are something new maybe in the last... 20 years, I think, last decade. And that provides improved land. So it's got infrastructure in it, water, sewer, electric to a beneficiary. And they can build whatever suits their needs to code um, for those who maybe can't afford to mortgage an entire four bed, three bath or three bed, two bath. We also have um, a project coming up in Mo'ili'ili uh, at Eisenberg, the former Bolodrome site, which is um, a condominium. We have rent to own. Now, would that be your first condominium if it's that built? Would be the first condominium. Which is an interesting concept because it's not the usual idea of a homestead, which is a house and lot in people's right. minds, or, or, or a farm or a ranch. Yeah. This is an actual condominium, which is you get a 99 year plus 100 year lease to air up well, in the air. That's the, the interesting thing is we. When, when the administrative rules were developed to allow for the condominium, we couldn't figure out a way to promise somebody a 99 year condominium because how many of those actually are there? So it's not, it's actually not a 99 plus 100. Oh. It's just a normal rental lease. And so those people maintain their spot on the wait list because we couldn't promise them the standard 99 year lease. I think if 
we get to an innovative point where we do have the ability to promise somebody that 99 year lease, then maybe we can adjust those rules. But it's also an interesting balance because while a majority of our beneficiaries, they want, they want the turnkey home, right? They want developed land. There are still beneficiaries out there who would love a condominium, who would love just vacant improved land. And so we are always thinking about ways to diversify the offering. Um, so one of the problems, one of the problems is that, and it's, you know, one of the problems with the, that people have been talking about with the, uh, with the program is that the waiting list is so long and have people on it have waited so long that I, I heard some statistic that it, about a third of the list is, are actually kupuna. They had actually been on the list for such a long time. And for one reason or another, whether the homestead was being offered on a different island, they couldn't afford it. But for one reason or another, um, they no longer really are people that should be, um, you know, that can have a house and lot. Uh, what, what? If anything, uh, has the department considered about developing senior or kupuna housing? We actually have a kupuna, a kupuna facility out in Waimanalo. Um, and I think it's a good model for if you've got the resources, how do you how do you create affordable housing for those, like you said, who have been on the wait list for a long time? It's actually half the wait list is over the age of 60 right now. Um, wow. It, it's it's really sobering because there are not many 60 plus year olds who are interested in building their dream house on vacant land. Many of them need something that's already suitable to their needs. So uh, you, you don't feel like you can, when you're 60 years old, that's, it'll be uh, fun to take on a 30 year mortgage. Tell my dad that. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to pass it to you. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it, you know, the only way these kinds of projects are possible is with, with resources to do it. And we've got limited funding to sort of put into the Kupuna project. If we had more, we would. We've got rental own that's coming out in um, on the Big Island soon. And it's modeled after an older rental own program we did uh, here on Oahu. But essentially, uh, you give beneficiaries who maybe can't qualify for a mortgage the opportunity to rent for a minimum period of time. And at the uh, expiration of that period, then they have the oppor opportunity to mortgage with the idea that they've been saving and planning for that 15, 20 year minimum that they've been renting. So reducing the threshold to home ownership is another strategy that the department has sort of put out there. Well, you know, we, our time is almost up. I, I wish, uh, you know, we, we did more, but I didn't have a chance to really learn more about you, no. Um, Tell us, when did you become, what's a little bit about your background? I, 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 you know. Sure. Um, I got my degree in Hawaiian language, Ola Hawaii, from UH Manoa. I went to same alma mater as you, William S. Richardson School of Law. Just a See, finally, out. finally we got it out. I, I, well, yeah, finally we got it. Okay, another uh, Richardson Law School graduate. Very Thank you. Great. Um, I, I clerked for a year. I was a public defender for over four years. Um, and then I stepped out and sort of ended up in consulting. I worked for a nonprofit that invested in uh, clean tech. And through all of those things, um, this opportunity came up. I applied and was very fortunate to be uh, interviewed. I, there, I think there was a bit of skepticism given my age. <laughs> Yeah. Being a relative newcomer to this level of politics, but you know, I think that I was brought here to sort of bring a new sort of younger, innovative energy, and I'm trying to do that. And I'm not saying every idea is the best one, but I think if we don't have these big discussions and think of out of the box ways to solve our problems, you know, we're not going to move past the status quo. So that's that's what I'm really trying to achieve. Well, I want to thank you very much for. Uh spending time with us today and talking about this very important issue. And uh, as people will tell you, uh, you know, the whole idea of gaming has been brought up over and over again and rejected over and over again. 
but so has the need for the constitutional mandate that you know sufficient resources be provided to the um, Department of Hawaiian Homeland. So maybe one of these days we'll be able to fulfill one or the other of these objectives, I, which I, uh, which are hopefully will result in in the Hawaiian Homes Program becoming uh, more viable than it has been in the past. So uh, thank you, Tyler. Appreciate your being on. Mahalo. Thank you.